Yeah, so there is a, um, let me go here. I'm at that link. Okay. <clears throat> See if you can log into Slido. If not, what happens is when you have moderation turned on, the the question um, appears um, on my on our screen, and then we could determine if hey, if we want to have the question be published and viewable to everyone. That's my understanding how it works. Oops, okay. I'm on the screen. Let me stop my video. Okay, it looks like we're about to start. And let me introduce you. Hello, everyone. You are in room three, and we're about to hear about how to reduce feature delivery friction with GraphQL, presented by Alex Kessinger. Um, also, if you have any questions, we have a Slack channel called uh, BMDD underscore room three. You can ask specific questions there. You can also ask questions within the um, within the Loud Swarm event uh, window. Thank you. So let's turn it over to, Al to Alex. Hello, everyone. Let me get my slides up. Okay, can I get a quick check, Ravi, that my slides can be seen? Yes, I can see your slides. Okay, awesome, thank you. I, yeah, I think we we have a little delay with the loud swarm. So we're about two or three minute delay, but I can see your slides. Okay, cool. <clears throat> um, hi, y'all. Thanks for coming to my presentation, how to deliver, how to reduce delivery friction with GraphQL. So right off the bat, um, I think a lot of people would agree that REST is a gold standard. Um, I think it's often the first choice that people make. And for many people, it's the only choice. But I think for some people, it's hard to scale organizational. It's hard to scale for your organization and for your feature set. And GraphQL might be able to help in this situation. Um, my name's Alex Kessinger. Um, I am a principal engineer at Stitchfix. Stitchfix is an online personalized styling company. Um, I work mainly um, on our customer facing applications. Um, I have 10 years experience working all over the stack. Uh, I'm currently working on a GraphQL adoption initiative uh, at Stitch Fix. Um, just a heads up, um, this presentation is a lot shorter than I thought it was gonna be. So um, I'm gonna give it and then I'm happy to engage with questions if, um, if that's helpful to y'all. So um, I'm gonna break this into three general sections. So the first section is that, you know, I think for a lot of organizations and teams, APIs happen organically at first. You know, you need something, you need a JSON API for a little widget on your website, or maybe you're trying to power your first IoT device or something like that. Um, and I think that a lot of teams will just sort of organically grow an API. I think that's the first section. But at some point you introduce friction or you know, it's just not working the way you want it to. So I think the, the next step after that, that you take control of your APIs. You recognize that they're fundamental to product delivery um, and you wanna turn them into something that is a, a, an asset um, and not something that's frictionful. And the last step is not only turning it from something that was organic and frictionful into something that's useful, but to actually turn it into a uh, tool of uh, velocity. So those are the three sections and we're gonna start off with APIs happen. I think RESTful is the default. I think um, for many organizations, um, you know, especially when we're talking about delivering an API over the web, um, you know, not something that's in, internal, you know, not an internal API. Um, and I'm also, you know, if it's unclear, I'm talking about web services. Um, I think that there's a long legacy of uh, 
building RESTful APIs, um, you know, like I think for the last 20 years or so, it's just been growing. And there's just so much support in every language that I think there's a very natural inclination to say, I need an API, well, I'm gonna produce a JSON API. And I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, I think the joke goes, no one ever got fired for buying IBM. Uh, same thing for a RESTful API. Um, I really believe though that, you know, the legacy of our JSON APIs comes from large web 2.0 uh, deployments, you know, Twitter, Flickr, other applications like that. They really led the way and demonstrated the power of APIs as platform. But I think that um, if um, your API needs aren't the same as some of these larger platform-based API plays, it may not make sense for you. You know, I think um, over time you organically grow your API presence, um, but at some point you have to ask yourself, like, what are we um, trying to build? You know, not just do I need an API, but now like, you know, what are our goals? You know, is your goal multiple external consumers that maybe you don't talk to, maybe you have an API, um, like, developer page that people can get credentials from, you know, if your needs don't match up with that of a large API platform, um, REST may not be a good fit. You know, uh, I think a couple of ways that like needs don't necessarily match up uh, are like internal APIs. You know, do you have a number of services? Um, are you being, are you trying to deliver an API to multiple platforms? You know, be that native, you know, maybe multiple web apps, me, um, IoT, you know, who knows? Um, you know, are your resources um, broad? You know, like, for instance, if you think about a Twitter API, the, a list of tweets is a really powerful uh, interface for, for Twitter. But if your product or your needs don't match up with a very with a more simplistic API, it may not make sense. And then also, um, there's been a push into things like micro web apps and microservices that uh, might make it harder to deliver a RESTful API. So we sort of went through this these phases at Stitch Fix. Um, before my time, there was a monolith, a Ruby monolith, and great you know, until it didn't anymore. And they made a choice to break into microservices and micro web apps. Um, if you're not um, sure what a micro web app is, but you can imagine like if you have an, a large micro, like a web application, um, just like you might have a monolith service that you break into services, you can break your micro, your web app into small pieces. You know, some people do that by path-based routing, some people do it by joining together a bunch of um, you know, React components on a page. But the idea is the same as a microservice. You're sort of reducing the scope of responsibility for a team and you sort of like unhook their delivery from the delivery of the entire application. But this was a decision that was made a couple years ago at Stitchfix. You know, and what we liked is that it inverted control to the team. So we like to think of it, it's low control, high velocity. Uh, sorry, local control, high velocity. Um, we appreciate how microservices and micro web apps um, lower coordination costs for our teams. But while we gained local control and high velocity, there are a couple things that are difficult when, as you begin to break apart your application. Uh, sharing UI components. Um, you know, and sharing APIs are a great example. Um, sometimes you develop a very valuable experience um, that you may want to share multiple parts of the web app. You know, taking those components and sharing them amongst a bunch of micro web apps um, can be frictionful. And the same thing with those APIs that power those UI components. And then lastly, talked about like, um, you know, if you've been building an application for the last 10 years or more, you might have moved from the web to native app. And, you know, if you want to power both experiences with the same set of APIs, um, there might be some friction there. Um, and then I, I don't mention this, but I know that 
a growing need is also like IoT and sort of like devices that aren't, you know, an iOS app or an Android app. So in the last year, um, Stitrix, we saw a growing need to address some of the friction in the way that we were doing um, APIs. And about a year ago, we chose to uh, experiment and with GraphQL and the, the early experimentation showed promise. So we started to pilot GraphQL uh, and grow its adoption. So one of the ways that we've started to um, look at our APIs is not just, you know, the technical delivery aspect of like, how do you support a product experience? But we focused, uh, you know, what are we trying to do overall? And I think these are shared amongst a lot of folks, but um, they aren't fully technical. So for instance, like our job as an engineering organization is to help the overall organization deliver value to our clients. You know, uh, um, and then, you know, once we have delivered that value, we wanna make sure that we protect it and that it doesn't, it's not broken. And then finally, over time, I think it's our job to increase the effectiveness of each individual on our team. Um, you know, I think over time complexity grows unless you work at it. And that complexity has the, the potential to consume more and more of an individual's time. And so it's our job to sort of focus on reducing complexity for our teammates and to help them increase their capabilities over time. Um, like I said, this, these aren't technical, uh, I'm not, I don't have any, you know, I'm not talking about technical topics here. I think that the, this is how we align with the business or the organization as a whole. And then we have to talk about what prevents the engineering organization from delivering value to clients? What's protect, what's preventing us from protecting the value that we've delivered? And what is preventing us from increasing the rate of value delivery? So I think this is something that's different for each organization, you know, but I think one of the things that we noticed for ourselves was that we just had a lot of APIs um, and those APIs might be doing slightly similar things. Um, even if they were, you know, one was for uh, a web app, it may not naturally lend itself to being a great API for an iOS application. And so we would find ourselves sort of copying or changing you know, which just led to a large number of APIs being created. Um, you know, so oftentimes if you had an API that was servicing one micro web app, it may not be easy to take that API and service another micro web app. And so you might end up copying that over. And the, that is a high velocity move, but over time, right, it might grow complexity. And so we need to find a way to make sure that we are like bringing that back and we're making it easier, but there was too much effort. And then lastly, um, you know, depending upon your runtime, but you know, I know that like Ruby, Python, PHP are very large, uh, you know, runtime in the, the world of web development, uh, delivering a consistent data shape that doesn't just sort of silently mutate is, uh, can be difficult for a lot of dynamic languages, but there's ways to fix that. So once we sort of understood what our goals were and we understood what the friction was, we could move to try and reduce that friction. So over the last year, uh, we've tried to thoughtfully expand our use of GraphQL in our customer facing applications and we're pretty happy with the results so far, and we will probably continue to use them in our customer facing applications. So one of the benefits that we found is that we can write, um, we can have all of our customer facing applications talk to one API. You know, as we build out new functionality, we're bringing together our cross-functional partners to understand, you know, needs across platforms. And through that sort of like alignment, 
we're able to then expose our functionality into one graph. And this is nice because you know, we have a microservices architecture. And so it allows teams to sort of unify their delivery through one graph while still maintaining independence um, of their application. And also we like the power of GraphQL to sort of empower the adapting our internal infrastructure to client specific needs. You know, like I think a clear difference is like image formats are different in iOS and the web maybe. So um, by moving to having one API for all of our customer facing applications, we were able to address part of the issue of having too many APIs. And this has been really powerful in um, the development of our APIs for our customer facing applications. So the next thing that we've found by adopting GraphQL that reuse is easy. Um, I, this is different than like, uh, we don't want to prematurely optimize. Like we're not trying to force anyone to just reuse whatever is there. But what we've done is if your specific feature that you're working on, it makes sense to reuse a piece of the graph, that is easy. You don't have to do a lot of, it's not effortful in the background to um, reuse. Um, really upfront, GraphQL sort of like describes every possible data shape and it describes all the interfaces that your uh, customer facing applications have. And we do that in one place. Um, you know, we're almost at the point where uh, a number of um, features could be delivered without any API changes. It's really exciting to me. You know, when you lower that coordination cost, uh, you really, I think you really boost velocity. And the last thing that we get from GraphQL is explicit runtime guarantees. Um, you know, as a service count goes up in a microservices architecture, the interfaces between your services are really important. Uh, we currently run a mixture of Ruby and Go and like Rails is a really great tool for getting uh, something out the door. Uh, but like Ruby and any other dynamically typed runtime, it's just sort of, they have a nasty habit of sort of returning something other than what you expect. You know, when you then take that and you apply it across a number of services, the problem becomes really compound. So what we like is that GraphQL allows us to build a really explicit interface and uh, be very clear around what we can guarantee and what we can't guarantee at runtime over our APIs. And this um, has uh, sort of eliminated a class of errors in our systems. And we think that it will continue to improve, improve velocity over the long run. So over the last, yeah. Um, so to wrap up, REST is often the first choice, the default choice, but um, as your APIs grow in your organization, you might hit a friction point. When you do, you know, take a step back, ask yourself what your goals are, um, try and understand what you're trying to do with your APIs. And then from there, you wanna make sure that your APIs are helping you deliver value and not standing in the way. And it's possible that GraphQL could help you in that journey. Thanks. I know this is really short, I apologize, um, but I'm happy to take any questions on uh, GraphQL. I can't see the, the Slido though. So um, if we, you could put questions in the Slack channel, that would be great.
Hi, so there's a question in the uh, Slack room from John Turner. What has been your strategy for versioning your GraphQL APIs over time? As a part of that, how have you kept track of who is using which version of which API so that you can know when to deprecate old versions? That's a great question. So, you know, in our RESTful world, we have, you know, very strong version numbers. You know, there's a V1 and a V2 and, and so forth and so on. And they're both, they, they map directly to, you know, HTTP endpoints. So it's very easy to sort of use any observability tooling to know who's using what. You know, in the graph, we're delivering one graph without versions, you know, not without, um, such, shall we say, V1, V2 versions. Uh, what you do in GraphQL is um, you can deprecate a field. Um, and so we have tooling that allows us to uh, deprecate a field, and then that sort of is communicated to our client tooling. And sort of when you build your client tools, it will raise that message up to you and say, hey, this field is deprecated. And usually we will provide some kind of migration strategy. And also we're only, pro pro we're only producing APIs for you know, other people inside of Stitch Fix, web developers and iOS developers. So we can, we can talk to them. Um, so once you've deprecated a field though, um, what we use is a, is a, we use observability tooling and stat tracking to uh, break down field usage, each GraphQL field usage by the, um, the, cons the, the consuming application. So, you know, if we find someone continually using a deprecated field, we can reach out to them directly and help them migrate from the deprecated version to the new version. Once you're certain that no one is using the deprecated field, you can remove it from your schema safely, and then that would eliminate usage of that field. Okay, we have another question from Wes Novak. One of the things you mentioned was too many APIs. What, what reduction in number of APIs did you see moving to GraphQL? Uh, that's a great question. So um, uh, just to back up a second. So <clears throat> we, uh, we still have a lot of APIs and they're powering a large portion of our web presence, iOS apps too. Um, what we haven't done is like remove the APIs. Uh, what GraphQL does though, is it sort of creates a facade on top of those APIs and it allows you to compose all of your internal APIs into one API. And we found that that's been useful for reducing the churn in our, in sort of like our front end customer facing application, OS app, React and so forth. So they only have to talk to one API, but then our GraphQL composition layer sort of takes the complexity of joining all the data together from our microservices architecture. So we have another question from Nathan Zaug. What kinds of problems is GraphQL good at solving? That's a great question. So, um, like I said, for us, we had a lot of friction points. I, was, you know, I talked about too many APIs, too much effort. Um, I think another interesting problem that we had were that uh, our iOS application and native applications and our web applications needed almost the exact same data, but not exactly the same data. Um, like I said, for instance, like the they would want different image sizes, you know, or Another great example is that, you know, um, web apps often will like load the list view and then you click and you go to a detail view. And those would be two different queries. Um, whereas on a, our iOS application might build out such that it wants all the data so it can render a list view. And then when a, client, when a person is on the interface and they click into a detail view, there isn't a subsequent API request. So all the same data, just in slightly different shapes. So before GraphQL, we were building bespoke APIs for each um, experience. Uh, with GraphQL, um, you sort of say, here's the data, and then the clients get to request however much or little they need of it. Um, 
you know, and so you can imagine that before that, that would have required a lot of engineering hours to produce both experiences and to monitor and make sure that everything's working correctly. And now we have a more unified interface and there's just less effort in maintaining um, all the data that our clients need. So we have another question from Blank Sorensen. What security issues are there with GraphQL? Um, well, first off, I'm not a security expert. Um, uh, I would argue that there are, they're different for each organization. Uh, but I think it, there's a few things that you wanna think about in general. So authentication, authorization, those are always important topics. Um, and like I said, it'll be different for each organization. Um, but when it comes to authorization, um, sometimes, you know, if you're trying to take your restful mindset to graph, it can be a little confusing, you know, because GraphQL objects are more highly nested than you might see in a RESTful API. Um, and you can build connections between objects. Uh, you sometimes have to worry about all the different ways a person can query the graph and make sure that your authorization strategy takes into account all the different ways that a person can sort of query an object. I think, you know, other security issues that are sort of on the line between security and maybe just general availability is that um, there is the opportunity for uh, a client to make a an unoptimized query. You know, you're sort of saying, here's everything you can get. And if you don't provide constraints around requesting too much data, uh, you can run into some trouble. Uh, but there's a couple ways to combat that. Um, in uh, at first, you can limit the amount of time that a query can run for. I think that's a great thing for any API response, but for GraphQL, it's one way of saying like, well, it just you can't get too much data. Um, the second way, and I don't know if all GraphQL runtimes support this, but um, the one that we do, we use an open source project called GraphQL Ruby. Um, you can assign a cost factor to every field in your graph. And so what that does is like before the query will even execute, it will sort of analyze the query. And if the query is too costly, you can sort of exit early. So, um, you know, right now, you, 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 I think a good idea at the beginning is just assign a cost factor of one to every field and just set some max, you know, like 100 or 200. Um, and then lastly, I think the besides uh, GraphQL, this is a good idea anywhere. Just, you know, look for unbounded queries in your graph um, and make sure that, that they just can't request unbounded data. 
I think um, there's some really great resources out there also. Um, you know, graphql.org is a great place to go. Um, and I'm blanking, but there's a great book that came out recently. I think it's called like Professional GraphQL or Production, Production Ready GraphQL, that's what it is. Um, it goes into a lot more detail um, about best practices around GraphQL. Thanks for the question. If anyone's still listening, thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I'll keep an eye on the, the Slack channel for a little bit and happy to talk more there if anyone has any questions. Um, otherwise, I'll see y'all later. Thanks.